Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Mike Rucker, my new friend, uh, a guy who has been married for 17 years, has two children, 10 and 6. He is an organizational psychologist, behavioral scientist, and charter member of the International Positive Psychology Association. He's earned five advanced degrees. He's got a new book coming out called The Fun Habit, which releases in January uh, of 2023, uh, subtitled How the Disciplined Pursuit of Joy and Wonder Can Change Your Life. This caught my attention. Uh, I definitely want to learn how to have more fun in my life, to be more joyful, to be more playful, um, not only just by myself, but with my wife and my children and my friends. In, 20, in 2007, by the way, Mike committed himself to 25 years of documented self-development and self-discovery. My team found this, and I thought this was really cool. So he committed to experiencing something new each quarter by way of an interesting event, life event, activity, or trip that by 2032, he'd have 100 unique experiences to relish upon when he concluded. So uh, an interesting guy, uh, a fun individual, I can say, and we're going to get into it today. So Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Um, when's your next interesting life event activity or trip and which one just ended? So I just got back from Brazil. Uh, my best friend and I, we turned 50 this year. So we, uh, want to do something together. And, uh, we went to Sao Paulo and, uh, got to check out formula one. We had uh pit tickets. So we got to hang out with all the crew and enjoy Brazil, which is just a phenomenal country. Yeah. It was a good time. And then the next one coming up, quite honestly, is this is my first book. So it's going to be a book tour, you know, getting to hit a bunch of fun cities and catching up with old friends and, you know, launching a published book for the first time. So yeah, two good ones. You caught me at a good time. Well, congratulations, man. Writing a book is no easy task. Um, I've done it. I've had friends who've done it and it's always a, a labor of love to get it together. And um, so I'm, I'm really excited about yours. Uh, let's let's launch in here mike with something interesting All that right. i found by listening to some of your interviews talk to us and, and i mean this fits perfectly with the book but rather than you know the getting into the science right away let's get into the human part of this let's tell me it. about tickle monster and heavy metal <laughs> yeah all right um so my wife finds fun and really low arousal activities. So we make a good match, you know, because we tend to introduce each other to things that we enjoy that we might not otherwise be exposed to, but she does not like rambunctious play. She is definitely the director of her house and, you know, keeps it clean and tidy, but I'm mayhem. You know, if you've seen the commercial, like that's just my style yeah. and, you know, my kids are young, so they're tenacious. So um, as a way to kind of appease everyone, uh, Tickle Monster is a game that I play with my kids where my wife goes upstairs, generally catches up on work, and we crank up what now is called dad rock, which kind of annoys me a little bit, you know, but it is what it is, you know, uh, like Tool or Rage Against the Machine. We crank it up to 11 and then we just, you know, run after each other in the house. And then, you know, they're faster than me. So, uh, you know, it's getting harder and harder each year. Uh, you know, it used to be a really fun game where I just immediately get them and kind of you know, catch and release. But now it's like, you know, when I do get them, it's, uh, you know, it's a win for me. But when I catch them, I just tickle all the heck out of them, which they love. And then, you know, and then we're back at it again. But it's it's crazy. We uh, we moved from uh, San Francisco to North Carolina. We're in the Greensboro area. And so, you know, another reason we do it is we're not used to having 4,500 square feet. You know, we grew up in a small two-bedroom house when the kids were really little. So just having you know, it's this humongous living room where we can, you know, <laughs> essentially slam dance each other. Um, yeah, it's a good time. And then it's a reprieve for my wife, right? And then, you know, we kind of turn down the volume, everyone catches their breath, we clean up anything that's broken, um, and, you know, <laughs> kind of get in our last laughs, and then she comes down and she's fine with it. So it's nice, you know, it's a good, it's a good activity for us. And, you know, it's a nice little you know, transition ritual where my wife knows it's coming. So, it's, you know, she gets out of the way and it doesn't bug her. Where does play not come natural to you? You know, that's a great question because I don't think it does. I mean, I really need to be deliberate. I'm not necessarily inherently a fun guy. I mean, I like to have fun, but I think, you know, especially in situations where there are a lot of people I don't know, that storming, forming, norming, you know, I don't know if I, I fit 
quite neatly in the socially awkward camp. But if I'm not used to you, I, you know, kind of, you know, fumble with my hands and kind of, you know, I'm not the first one to jump in and, and lead the group. If I know you, then a lot of people rely on me for a good time because, you know, if that trust is there and that rapport, um, you know, we're off to the races. But that, that's an interesting question because I have realized I'm a little bit more socially awkward than I initially thought, mainly because I am being really mindful, you know, about all of these experiences now. Yeah. And is that why you wrote the book? Did, did you write it because you're like, I mean, I, I want to be more fun? Well, I wrote the book because I had optimized my life for happiness. So I'm a big quant guy. I love systems and they've suited me well. That's why I've been a, you know, a humble, but somewhat successful entrepreneur. I've had successful exits, you know, things that are sort of, you know, trophies of uh, successful entrepreneurship run. Uh, but I had over optimized for happiness. And I found at a certain point in my life that the more I was chasing happiness, paradoxically, I was becoming a lot less happy, like fairly quickly. And I wanted to unpack why. And so what do you mean by that? I mean, the more so my brother died in 2016. And I was basically trying to will myself, you know, back into just my old self, I wasn't taking the time to mourn his death. Some other interesting challenges presented themselves. I'd been an amateur athlete up to that point. Um, you know, not one that was trying to go professional, but using that as a way to mitigate stress. And, and it was just a fun activity for me and found out that I had advanced osteoarthritis that kind of just came out of nowhere. I'd actually run one of my fastest half marathons. And then like three weeks later, I was limping and I didn't know why. And once I got the x-rays, they're like, your femoral head is sitting on your pelvis. And so that, and that came about two or three months after my brother passed. So not correlated. They think it was due to an injury that went unnoticed, you know, it wasn't like stress or whatever, but, um, you know, it was another thing I had to mourn, right? My identity was as a triathlete and I wasn't one anymore. And so those two things both knocked me on my, you know, my butt and, um, but I was trying to use all these tools of positive psych that had been helpful, gratitude journaling, you know, trying to be mindful and really just trying to will myself out of it. And it wasn't working. I was just getting more frustrated. I wasn't being a good father and husband. Um, and I wanted to know why. And so one thing that's interesting, you know, I, I know we don't want to jump right into the science, but I was lucky in the sense that emerging research was coming out uh, during that era that was showing that this Western ideal of happiness, so not necessarily valuing happiness or wanting everyone around you to be happy, but being overly concerned of your own happiness. So you're ruminating it on, you know, all the time is a pretty direct path to poor mental health. In fact, so much so that you can make a pretty strong argument that that's one of the you know, leading causes of depression. And so I found that really interesting, but if these tools of positive psych, you know, weren't helpful in that time period, what could I do? And I found that, you know, and this came from some of my background in workplace wellness as an academic, like I had lost my agency. I kind of lost control over what I wanted to do because instead I was ruminating, uh, you know, so much about what I wanted instead of just going and living my life. And so it was just that subtle shift of reclaiming my agency and autonomy that kind of pulled me out. And there's a lot of science to back that up. You start indexing opportunities, you know, for joy and delight, you start to recalibrate yourself to see the world in a positive way. And you start to think more optimistically. How does that play out practically to index, you know, these memories, these ideas? So generally for busy adults, it means really looking at how you're spending your time, right? I mean, you know, entrepreneurs tend to be a little bit more deliberate about their time, but a lot of folks, you know, there's this thing called the U-shape happiness curve, right? And it's because, you know, folks in their thirties and fifties, we're all living longer, having our kids later, right? Which means we're playing a new game, a game that, you know, prior adults didn't play where we have young kids, but we also have aging parents. So a lot of our life is being organized from the sense of duty. And once we start to habituate that, you know, it's our, our week just becomes routine, which is comfortable in one sense, but then also essentially gives everything away. We start to get unhappy and we don't know why. And so by, in, you know, just reclaiming even one to three hours of your week and saying, hey, I'm going to go out and do something fun, even if that's just reorganizing something that you have to do, like spending time with your kids, you know, something as simple as, you know what, 
Saturday, I just sit on the bench and watch him play and maybe futz around with social media. That's not bringing me joy. Like, let's go figure out what would make all of us happy. You know, for me, that's going to the go-kart track because that's what my son and I like. So that's way better than being up. Seeing a racing theme, Mike. Yeah. You know, it's just funny because I'm not a car guy, but uh, I'm an an old car guy. I love VWs, but uh, yeah, I might have to explore that more. (laughs) Yeah, there's something there. Yeah. Uh, On that note of play and engaging with your kids, I've heard you say that you love building, but you're not a fan of toys. Tell me more about that. Yeah, so... The reason I villainize toys a little bit is that it's clear they have uh, diminishing returns, right? And so, you know, again, my work is how do we extrapolate the most joy out of any investment we make? And so toys cost money and generally they create a lot of joy for your kids or you, because I love buying toys myself, right? And then ultimately they, you know, people lose interest in what they buy. And so it's not all things, right? Like I certainly advocate you know, a guitar can bring you joy for as long as a guitar plays, right? So, you know, I, I, we live in a capitalist society. I'm not suggesting we don't buy things, right? But I'm saying a lot of what we buy generally can start to diminish with regards to the joy it brings. What we know about experiences is that those tend to, one, create the social glue that connects us to the people that we love or like, um, and two, it allows memories that sort of lead to the ability to reminisce them over time, so they help build resilience. And so there's clear evidence to suggest that we should have a bias over experiences versus things. Do you have that naturally? No. An enjoyment of experiences over things? No, I have to be deliberate about it. I, yeah. I'm one of the guys that if I'm on Amazon, I'm like, oh, that looks great. I'm at that, those algorithms bait me every single time. In fact, I think yeah. I have five silly things coming, you know? And so what I do is I always try to plan ahead. I follow travel hackers because I'm not good at that. That's not a, you know, discipline I know well, but it's so easy now to get good at it by, you know, following the advice of others. Uh, And now a lot of the credit cards have experience libraries, right? Because, you know, not to go on a lesson about travel hacking, but so many of us, especially that are deliberately doing it, have so many miles that they're trying to get us to spend them. And so you can go to like, you know, amazing concerts, you can do, you know, these amazing experiences with your kids like Legoland or something that are unique and exclusive. And so I'll use those opportunities to kind of get ahead, I, what I call a fun file. So I create these things, you know, where there's a little bit of premeditation. So it's not just like, oh, what are we going to do on the family vacation this year? I'm like getting ahead of it and, you know, not spending a ton of time, but hey, what would be cool? And then also trying to get buy-in, right? Because one of the things I firmly believe is that you need to ask your kids what they want to do. You know, oftentimes, and I fell victim to this as well, you prescribe things to your kids without even asking them if they like it, right? Because you're just like, oh, I like to do that as a kid. And I see that, you know, a lot of times, you know, um, not end well. So I'm, I'm still, I can tell I'm still curious about the over optimizing, because I feel like that is something that I would do and that other people would do. And I want to just stick in there, stick with that for a minute, because can you talk to us more about what that might look like? If somebody was questioning that themselves, like, am I over-optimizing? Am I trying so hard at this that it's actually working against me? Like, yeah, so that's a great I think question. back to golf when I was, you know, I would grip the club and I would grip it so tight. And I'm like, the harder I grip this motherfucker, you know, the better I'm going to hit it. But the truth is that it was about actually being able to be loose in that moment. No, so that's... grabbing a hold of something can actually work against you, right? Like, God damn it, kids, we're going to have some fun if, whether you like it or not. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. Um, and that's a great metaphor. You know, essentially the frame that I like to use is that happiness is an exercise in evaluation and fun, the way I describe it, is an action bias, right? And so you're never having to evaluate you know, am I happy? You're essentially creating a balanced life where you're enjoying yourself in the moments that you recapture. And as long as you have this sense of control over your life, that leads to a general sense of well being. It's when you're always kind of thinking, is there enough? Right. In psychology, we call that the hedonic treadmill. And it's a socially means that 
where happiness becomes problematic is we're good at adapting as humans and, and part of happiness requires us to compare ourselves to others. So it's really just an act of mindfulness, right? Like if I'm enjoying this activity, then be where your feet are, right? Like enjoy that activity and then just make sure that you're doing those activities. Certain people are going to have more fun if there's a variety of activities in their life. Some that are really good at mastering a certain skill, you know, it, it's just up to your personality. We'll want to stay with one thing. You know, golf is certainly uh, something that a lot of my neighbors around here love doing every week, right? And so to answer your question specifically, it's you just don't want to compare you want to enjoy your time. Mike, I want to take a minute and go back here in your life for, for a, a bit, because I think this is an important piece of the journey. And I'm going to try to connect a bridge between your past and your present and what you're doing. Sure. And when I think about, when I've listened to your interviews and, and gotten familiar with your work, we talk, there, there is talk about time poverty, right? And there's about how, creating space. It's almost like if I just create space and room for joy to occur, room for fun to occur, in some ways it, it then has a chance to be brought into the mix, right? Absolutely. And that's how, I'm, that's how I'm choosing to see how I'm learning about your work. But I do know that there's something that happened early in your life when you were 17, that to me that involves space, freedom, right? And, and this ability for expanse in, in your world. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I think what you're bringing up is I got emancipated. So, you know, again, I, I mean, we have a lot to unpack because I haven't really talked about this publicly. I don't think um, I do talk about it in the book a, a little bit. And that is, you know, my dad and my mom were both professors at UC Davis in a publisher parish sort of game, you know, and so they just were never home. They essentially outsourced parenting to a host of different grad students. And I was someone who still has high affinity needs. You know, I confess to you, I'm a little bit socially awkward, but I'm, I rely on my friends and family heavily, um, my, my, my family here. And so I just wasn't getting that. And it led to, a, you know, a lot of behavioral issues and really what I wanted was just one, some inclusion, but two, they were overbearing, you know, they weren't necessarily there, but they did want to take all control. And I just wasn't enjoying myself to the point where I was, you know, to actualize any sort of joy in my life, I need to get out of this environment. And I was doing some unhealthy things. So there was a mutual exchange of value because I was throwing a lot of parties and, um, I think they were a little bit worried about being the deep pockets, you know, uh, you know, if someone drove home drunk or whatever, um, rightfully. And so we kind of parted ways and I held that for quite some time, you know, I, I'm taking a bit of a left here from what you asked, but um, it certainly affected who I was and who I wanted to be, especially when I got married and started having kids to the point that I've now needed to course correct, right? Because I so tried to overcompensate for what I wanted as a child. I began to have what they call in psychology, this anxious attachment to my kids, you know, where I was really looking for validation from them, where again, that, you know, that might be a more eloquent answer to your previous question. Again, that was an outcome-based behavior, right? Like, hey, well, I've created this kind of interesting environment, almost overcompensated, and you're not giving me back what I've asked for. And like, that is the exact wrong framework to go into a relationship. I've heard you talk about it because I did my due diligence on you as well. And like, you know, you put in the reps, but you don't necessarily ask for anything in return. And I was right, because I wanted, you know, I, I wanted what I didn't have. And so now I just go in knowing that the gift I can give to them is trying my best and don't necessarily ask for anything in return. And similar to what I found with fun, you know, that's when things start to grow, right? Because you're putting air back in the room because you're not necessarily outcome focused. You're just like, okay, this didn't work. Oh my gosh, this worked amazing. Let's do this again. And it just kind of grows rather than completely unpacking, you know, every situational activity of, you know, for some sort of success metric. How much of a role does trauma play in our inability to have fun as adults? I think everyone should do the work, 
right? And so I'm not a clinical psychologist, but I'm certainly adjacent to that and talk to a lot of clinical psychologists to do my work. And so there's some interesting arguments going on right now for anyone that's, you know, actively in therapy, you know, where CBT really tries, sorry, cognitive behavioral therapy really tries to unpack that versus ACT, which is really just about acceptance and then figuring out what's the right set of tools. Not being a clinical psychologist, I don't necessarily want to be prescriptive in my answer. What I'll say in my own life is I needed to forgive and move on. So acceptance was a more powerful tool for me. The trauma is always going to be there, but I forgive my dad for the fact that he prioritized his career and not me. That was his choice. And I can either hate him for the rest of my life for it or go, ahead. you know, he made a choice. It wasn't something that necessarily I enjoyed, but he still loves me. You know, every time I fell down, he picked me back up. So he's not a villain, even though I villainized him, you know. And how's your relationship now? If Good, because I forgiven his shortcomings. He'll never apologize. I waited years for that. And he doesn't think that he did anything wrong, again, because he was playing a different game than me, right? And so, okay, you know, I could wait around for that, right? But what a poor use of time. I mean, as you know, that's a construct I love playing with and clearly is you know, something that's important to our happiness. And I was spending too much time waiting for that. And he's a good guy. He just doesn't think he did anything wrong. You know? Are you still throwing parties? Yeah. <laughs> what do you think I did in Brazil? <laughs> <laughs> that's so cool. Dude, one of the best. I mean, again, I just want people to know I'm human. Cause as you know, a lot of the times I go on these podcasts, you know, it is about all the research. Cause that's really where I've found fun. I like unpacking things. And, yeah. you know, um, again, probably because of my parents, I value being an intellectual, right? I, I value understanding deeply the things I talk about, but I still have this clipping. My ex-girlfriend sent it to me and it says, um, crime stinks because me and I, I won't, um, I won't be a narc on the other folks, but we were throwing a party when we were 19 and our toilet was broken and so we're like, what do we do? And we stole a bunch of outhouses and put them in our backyard. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> and uh, we got caught after the party. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it was, it, I made, I think that's the first time I made the Davis paper. So <laughs> <laughs> not, not bad for, uh, <laughs> did you call yourself an introvert? Are you an introvert? Uh, I always test right at the line. You know, anyone yeah, that's yeah. gone to business school has to go through Myers-Briggs and like, I waver back and forth. It always is like, you know, a couple points over on the extroversion scale, but you know, anyone that's listened to Susan Cain, you know, talk, she has a book called quiet. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Um, you know, the, there's flavors to extroversion. So I think I definitely value people's opinion and I like being around people, but that storming, norming, forming phase for me is uncomfortable. So, you know, I think true extroverts are just like, lightning in a bottle, right? They go into a conference and they're like, you know, have five friends within an hour. You know, my relationships tend to be richer. Like I kind of wait, you know, to make sure that there's a way to have some sort of rapport um, and generally don't put my best foot forward until I really feel comfortable. Let's talk about your relationship with your kids for a quick second as it relates to the book. If I asked your kids, is dad fun? What would they say? <laughs> oh my gosh. I've actually had this on a post-it note and no one's asked me. So again, something you're getting for the first time because I just found this out and it's, I'm going to put it on LinkedIn. So it might, you know, there might be a couple of clues before this airs, but I just found out my biggest fan is my daughter. And I, it was a surprise to me, right? She's been just consuming these podcasts and I was like, that's awesome. You know, but again, you got to remember, she's been listening to this nonsense since about 2017, right? And I was like, so are you enjoying them? And she's trying to hear the stories about her, right? But she just said straight up, like without candy coating it. She's like, I love hearing your voice because she's using them to fall asleep. She has a little bit of insomnia. And she's like, it's just comforting to know that you're in the room, right? So I'm melting, right? Like, oh my gosh, every dad wants to hear that. And and then she's like, and also it bores me pissless. So I go right to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. So she says, I, I, you know, exploring the science of fun, I suck the fun out of fun. So um, <laughs> she loves what we do, but not, not what I talk about. And That's my, funny. my son is, uh, man, he's just uh, 
a ball of energy. So he doesn't care. I mean, you, we have a ton of fun together, you know, yeah. and do all the things dads are supposed to do. We rough house. And I mean, I just can't wear that guy down. It's, you know, bananas. It's like the more I feed him, I know, man, you know, the bigger monster he becomes in a good way. <laughs> yeah. When you look around to other dads, uh, that you get a chance to see, it, you know, not, not just hear about, not, not celebrities, not people like that, but people that are in your, in your proximity, who comes to mind as somebody that is playful, fun, joyful with their kids? Yeah, I would say my best friend. I mean, I really, you know, I think all of us, we look for our network and try and pull the meat from the bone. And he's really deliberate about being there at sports and prioritizing them. You know, he's, busy uh, he you know again gsb stanford mba grad so his time um you know can be filled with all sorts of activities but he starts there you know he schedules time around his kids and then work kind of fills in the gap um because he doesn't have a structured uh day to day and so that's something you know where one it's in a line with what i believe but two he's doing it so well that I follow his lead for sure. Cause his kids are a little bit older. So I think it's always yeah. good to see, you know, especially w- what we were talking about before we hit record, you know, the world's different. And I think if you try and see it through the lens of how you grew up, because there's so many new challenges that can be quite problematic, but, and this goes back to Dan Gilbert stumbling on happiness. We just know that uh, folks that are a few years ahead of us that we admire. And again, I, I'd hope that you admire your best friend, you know, or at least your close five, like what they're doing, right. Just take that in, you know, because they are a couple steps ahead of you and mm-hmm. it's likely going to work for you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let, let's get into the science of this too. Now. Um, I want to talk about some of the research. I want to talk about what the data is telling us. Um, what do you think is perhaps the biggest myth when it comes to fun, the most controversial data that was dug up by you or your team? Yeah, I think it's really this underpinning that this Puritan work ethic that we all fall victim to, and like the most nefarious to try and give you a discreet answer is how many of these systems are sort of rigged against us, right? For entrepreneurs, a lot of that can be, you know, the dissemination of hustle porn, where it's like, you know, the motivation doesn't hit. So we start to sense some guilt. And that guilt generally sucks our energy out. So it becomes this downward spiral to folks that are working for organizations that fit into this new model of knowledge work, where we don't know where the goalposts are. And so if you're not flipping the script and kind of taking time off the table for yourself first, and then, you know, it's that classic Stephen Covey, you know, that I think most people have seen about, you know, where he starts with the sand and then puts in the small rocks and then, yeah. So I think most of your listeners will probably be familiar. Unfortunately, that's where we're at right now. Right. You know, Daniel Pink talks about it in drive when we moved, when we moved from, algorithmic work to heuristic work where we don't really know, you know, when we're done, we have this tendency. And again, it's traced back to, you know, us just really believing in this work ethic that we have to fill our time first with work. And because there is no end, that's created this really nefarious model where most of us are serving a master that doesn't necessarily have our best interest at heart. So how do you figure out those solid lines where you're protecting yourself from that? And the data is clear, right? Record levels of burnout, especially for males. You know, this has just come out in the last two weeks, record levels of loneliness, which we know, you know, has a direct line to all sorts of physiological problems like cardiac health and poor mental health, right? And then just boredom in general, you know, we start to kind of relinquish our agency and autonomy over our calendar and we find ourselves bored. And then, you know, this work comes from folks like Nir Ayal and others. When we get into that negative valence state, we don't necessarily feel unhappy, but we fill our time with distractions. So we just, you know, aren't in that state. And it's not necessarily the best use of our time. It's because we haven't gotten in front of it. We haven't been premeditated about how we want to spend our time. So time just starts to pass us by. So that's really like the biggest eye-opening thing is that we have so many systems that are rigged against us. You know, 
whether again, that's sort of um, this over marketing of motivation that doesn't really hit, that's not useful, but feels real. And so we fall victim to it again, to things that are rigged against us. So even, you know, entrepreneurs that are sort of living in the gig economy that, you know, um, where they're being sort of, uh, there's this gamification to get them to work more, but the companies that they're, you know, that are operating in the marketplace are extrapolating more and more value out of their work to just, you know, folks that do work a nine to five. And I use that just as a term for regular work, you know, that don't know, you know, when it ends. So they don't create transition rituals. They walk into their house still on their phone and don't realize that they might think it's family time, but their subconscious is essentially looking that as an extension of work, right? Yeah. I mean, if you're sitting there and thinking you're playing with your kids, but every 15 minutes, just checking to see if you have a new email, that's still work time. It, you know, and if that's happening through the night, which a lot of us, myself included, if we're not paying attention can happen easily, then essentially the whole day is now a work day. And that got really nefarious during uh, COVID, right? Because we just, we were essentially, you know, work and home was the same thing. So there was no way to separate the two. Now, the that, that, by the way, real quick, that, that was me of realizing that I didn't have a play problem or a fun problem. Like, let's say, let's call it evenings and weekends. Yep. What I had was a work problem that was bleeding into those times. I didn't have transition. I didn't have space. I didn't have uh, an opportunity for my thoughts to settle down. I was moving so fast because I was so efficient. So I thought of like, I'm going to work right up until the time when I got to see my family. You know, I'm in the car sending that last email and then walking right into the family that I didn't give myself a chance to settle down. Almost like your HRV doesn't automatically calibrate to rest and digest if you're in fight or flight. It's not instant. It's not like I'm going to flip the switch. It, it takes a little time for your body to stop vibrating at the work intensity, that hustle intensity. And it's very difficult for me to uh, be playful when I'm hunting. And I think biologically speaking, that's supposed to be the case, right? I'm not supposed to be super silly when I'm about to hunt for the family. That's I'm right. in hunter mode. I'm yep. in focus mode exactly. and I need to have transition time. That was probably the biggest thing for me of becoming more fun. I actually didn't need to become more fun or find better jokes or any of that. I just needed to not do this other thing in order to do this other thing over here. And I love that you brought up HRV. So for folks that don't know what that acronym means, it's heart rate variability. And generally I don't talk about it because it's pretty esoteric, right? But so I have an aura ring and I'm at sometimes you know, you can get too geeky about this. And so I certainly, you know, don't go overboard, but um, like, if you don't believe what we're talking about right now, right, just even have a transition ritual back to work and try and answer emails and then see what your HRV is right before you go to sleep and see that your heart, you know, that your resting heart rate doesn't drop till five in the morning. Or you could be like me. And sometimes there are going to be periods where you got to hustle, right? I just created a book there were three months where I gave myself grace because I needed to get through it, right? And I had done the work, so I was able to have that equity that I kind of rode. And then I, re then when it got too out of hand, I course corrected, right? I mean, that's, I think, you know, once you get really mindful of this, then you have the opportunity to have kind of a bigger playground with it. But at the end, I caught myself taking Lanesta because I couldn't get right to sleep because I was grinding it out so hard. And I do always you know, I value sleep. In fact, I always say, just as a quick aside, I think we're going to start valuing fun and leisure the same way we're now valuing sleep, right? Like no one, even the Gary V's and the Grant Cardones of the world would say that you should not sleep anymore, right? But in the 90s, they were saying that. Gary V would say like, hey, you know, if you really want it, stay up till three, right? Like what an asinine suggestion because we now know productivity falls off a cliff if you're not sleeping, and we know that about leisure too. It's just not been, we haven't talked about it enough, right? But Fortune 500 companies get it. That's why they're incentivizing people to take their PTO now. You think it's because they want to? No, it's because they know that if you actually are enjoying yourselves a little bit, you're going to come back and be a better employee. And so, you know, you just need to check in with yourself. When I realized like, holy, I'm taking a pharmaceutical intervention, you know, so that I can sleep because that's how hard I'm grinding. 
I knew I had to like reorganize the way I was spending my time. Dude, there's a new, I don't know if it's new, actually new to me, a uh, documentary on Netflix about Xanax. Have you seen this? I haven't, no. Uh, I think the whole thing is fascinating when it comes to, uh, in, in what category am I talking about, by the way? Um, yes, that's right. Yes. That idea, it, which has crept into my life periodically but when I've been grinding, like you said, so hard that nothing else would seem to work. Meditation, all the things I have been so tempted and even experimented with those types of medications. Uh, but I know deep down in my heart, man, that there's a lot of danger as it relates to that. And um, I'm, and thank goodness to things like the Aura Ring and other trackables, because I'm not a huge data guy, but if I see a trend, uh, it does, I'm a visual guy is what I am. And if I see, if you show me a chart and you show me that over time and you correlate it to things that I'm doing with my life, that makes a huge difference. I think you'll enjoy my slant on quant when you get the book, because yeah. I, I, it's exactly in line with that. I got this from Jordan Etkin out of Duke, but we went way too far. I mean, it's essentially, I think, a great metaphor with regards to focusing too much on the numbers for everything we've talked about today, right? When you get that far in the weeds, then you start to lose focus on what the real KPI should be because you're essentially being force fed one, right? Yes. But if you know what you're trying to solve for, and that is the long game in your case, you know, the benzos is a short game. It gets you where you want, you know, through a shortcut versus being mindful and really deliberate about your time, which, you know, can calm you down in the same way. In fact, serendipitously, that research just came out in the last six weeks that mindfulness practice is actually beating benzos for anxiety interventions that saying, I want to solve for this and then using quant for that. Amazing, right? It's when you, we go too far into this introspection where weird stuff starts to happen on all aspects, all domains, in my opinion. Let's zoom out for a minute, Mike, on the book and just say, what do you want the book to do for its readers? Yeah, I really just want people to realize how easy it is to recapture your agency and autonomy. And for those that have engineered fun, joy and delight out of their lives, how easy it will be for them to recapture it. And so it's a set of tools, you know, based on wherever you are sort of at in your life um, to kind of do so. So, you know, the first couple of chapters have some easy exercises to kind of, you know, understand where you're at and, and recalibrate. And then, you know, the rest of the book is dependent on where you're at, you know, parenting, folks that are looking for social engagement, you know, folks that are looking to improve, um, you know, fun at the workplace, et cetera. How did the write, how did the writing of the book change your life? Man. So I think similar to yourself, I just like connecting with people again, you know, three of the constructs that I talk about when we're looking to enjoy things more is, controlling who you get to connect with, you know, deliberately choosing the environments, and then obviously deliberately choosing the activities. And so getting to connect with all these, you know, interesting researchers, because this book, I'm really standing on the shoulders of giants, you know, there's not a lot of my original research in there, just getting to talk to all these cool people that really are like worried about solving this problem. And so that was the funnest is, you know, building my corpus of wisdom through people a lot smarter than myself. And when it comes to your role as dad, not specifically tied to the book, if there were three principles for parenting that you lean on, what might they be? Yeah, so I talk about two in the book and then I'll give you a third. So, and these are specific to fun, obviously, because you know that's the topic of our conversation, right? But if you're looking to have fun with your child, as a general rule, let them lead, right? A lot of us have softened our play muscles and they're the best teachers, right? I mean, we really think linearly because that's what we need to do as adults. We have heuristics and algorithms that help us, you know, optimize our life. They think in a non-linear funk, you know, fashion. So let them lead and like enjoy that and get creative and flex all those muscles that you haven't flexed in a while. But the second, which is equally as important, if you're not enjoying yourself, then it's not fun. You can co-create these experiences with them so if you're always doing it from a sense of duty, like I just got to get them out of the house because they've been on screens too much, but you're hating your time, remember you're allowed to do it. If your kids weren't enjoying the time with the friends that they were spending, they would cut them off quickly. So, you know, why not figure out again, that anecdote of, you know, going to the go-karts, 
whatever that means to you. You know, did you like martial arts when you were younger? Why don't you two take a martial arts class? For my daughter, that's exactly what I did. I'm a, again, being socially awkward. I don't like dancing in front of people, but I love dancing. So when my daughter was young, she was taking a gymnastics class, essentially just to get her out of the house, right? Because she wasn't developing skills yet. Now she's a pretty good gymnastics, uh, you know, good at gymnastics. But I realized I was just taking her to this tumbling class and stand, sitting on the bench. So I, I mean, it was a total hour wasted for me. And again, using, you know, eating my own dog food, I pulled her out of that gymnastics class and we went and took private dance lessons for only like $10 more a week. And now we look back at those memories. They were so fun. We broke so many eggs. You know, I got to dance in front of her. I, you know, an amazing audience and we just had a great time. So um, those are, you know, the two rules in the book. But the third, you know, kind of falling back on my love for psychology is that if you want your children to do something, you know, especially as a parent, then model that behavior. Um, and I don't know, anyone that's taken a psychology 101 class probably have seen these videos, but for anyone that kind of has resistance to what I just shared, I encourage you to YouTube um, the Bobo doll experiments. They're from the 1960s. And just, I mean, they're really old and it was at a time when you could do crazy psychological experiments on kids, <laughs> but essentially it has really aggressive adults beat the heck out of a, a, a doll. And the kids with no instruction at all are just left in the room with the same doll and they beat the crap out of it the same way the adults do. Kids are monkey see monkey do, right? And so, so many of us, you know, do what I say, you know, not what I do. And that just doesn't work in this current framework. I think it worked, you know, based on the research that I've seen, those are frameworks that used to work, especially when we were more trad focused, right? Because there were, there was a different structure to, you know, how you kind of operate within the social norm. But now because the relationships are so intimate, your kids are going to do what you do. And so if you start to see them doing something that you don't like, the first thing to check in with is, am I doing it right? There's, you know, I've already kind of villainized memes, but one that I really did like was a mom on the phone and her kid playing on TikTok, asking a mom who was reading a book and her daughter who was reading a book, like, oh my gosh, I'm trying to get my daughter to read. How do you do it? Mm -hmm. You know? And I think that speaks volumes more than I could ramble on about. Right. And so that's, that's number three. And Mike, what, what else would you like to say to the men in the front row dad community that has not been said today or what, what, question should I have asked that I didn't ask? That all of us are different. So pull the meat from the bone from whatever anybody is telling you. I think one area I'm getting choked up a little bit where I'm humbled. And that's because Micah, my best friend that I've mentioned several times, was a Marine fighter pilot and he did two tours. There are going to be folks that are first responders um, that, you know, for whatever reason, can't give 100%. Just do the best you can. You know, like, some of these things are meant to be listened to when you're at a good place and can implement them. But again, when motivation doesn't hit, it turns into guilt. And my biggest fear is that that might happen to a dad, you know, that's in a place that can only pull off an hour, you know, or maybe is on tour and it's like worried about that six months or away. If you're doing the best you can, then that is success, you know? So, you know, you know just take the wisdom that you can and apply it so that you can do it. I think that's the takeaway, you know, so it doesn't turn toxic. When you say first responders and then not giving, not being able to give a hundred percent, what do you mean by that? That you, so some of those dads are working like 24 hours on and are right. just exhausted when they get home. Right. You know, and so a lot of the advice that you hear on parenting podcasts, you know, are about people that can take time off the table, you know, every weekday night, right? Just spend a little bit of time. Or again, this ugly word that we use, optimize. Sometimes optimize isn't met, you know, in the context of certain disciplines, right? So it's just what can you give back within the capacity that you have? And if you're child focused, then, then that's going to happen naturally, right? But again, all of this advice is meant to work for some people and it might not work for you. So if it doesn't, don't necessarily let it turn into guilt. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, um, I want to thank you for being my guest today, and I want to thank you for writing the book. Uh, can you tell us all where to get the book and when it's available in case this podcast is either dropping just before 
uh, or near the launch time? Yeah, definitely. It's available everywhere. Luckily, I had a, I got a major publisher, so that was a, that was a fun ride. Uh, so wherever you buy books, you know, it's available for pre-order everywhere: Barnes and Noble, Amazon, or your local bookstore. Uh, drops January third, so it should be there right after the new year. And uh, if you're interested in any of the kind of science, I write a lot about it um, at my website, michaelrucker.com. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, Mike, thank you again for making time. Uh, I'm glad that we got connected. And uh, I love that on these on these types of conversations, these interviews that we get a chance to do, that we walk away with better questions often, right? And, you know, if if men walked away today with a question they could be asking themselves, what might that question be? Yes. Are you spending your time deliberately, right? So many of us have habituated behavior. And I think an easy exercise for anyone listening, especially because we now know how damaging it is, is look at the health meter on your phone. Both iPhone and Android will let you know how much time you spent on certain apps. And if you're spending two hours on Instagram or Facebook, you know, think about what would happen if you could take that time back in your week and spend it with your kids or doing something that would fill you up, you know, that's more invigorating than just passing time by. Dude, I just deleted yesterday Facebook and Instagram from my phone. There you go. For, for the next two weeks. So uh, I, I recognized that I was... Um, getting sucked into that. I would go in for like, well, business, I'm posting this podcast and I would then just get trapped. And I would recognize that energy being, you know, uh, I don't want to say stolen because right, I'm giving it uh, to them, but that I would love to give that energy in different ways. But you could and play in the middle because they're the first to admit, I mean, you know, uh, the engineers of those apps are all, confessing online that they've rigged the game against you they're meant to capture yeah. your attention they want to so, yeah get you addicted yeah yeah you did give your time away but it it you know in a in kind of in a nefarious fashion so i give yourself a little bit of grace um in the same thing there's you know some great apps for chrome i use the same devices that block that stuff during certain periods because yeah. you and i are running a business right and so you know you do want to engage and i think Facebook, especially for me, is one of the best ways. I know it's an old man's game now, but, you know, the best way to see and relish in my friend's kids doing amazing things, you know, so that we can share yeah. in a way that's scalable. But yeah, those those sinkholes, those traps, you know, and um, again, I have these mechanisms, so I don't do it anymore. But like, I, all of a sudden, I'll be on a page of someone that I don't even know because I'd like, you know, just one time. Right. <laughs> right. Of course, we all have. Yeah. Um, thanks again, Mike. Appreciate you being here. Guys, please go out and uh, get the book. Check it out. Check out Mike's work. And uh, we'll put all the notes over at frontroadads.com. And guys, if you're interested in joining our brotherhood of more than 300 men from 15 different countries where we're getting together monthly and having uh, deep conversations, the type of conversations that most fathers, husbands, family men won't have, aren't having, then join Front Row Dads. Um, we're open for a short period of time through January, and then we'll close up membership again. So if, if you're hearing this message and you feel the time is right, then jump into the conversation. Uh, there are many investments we can make into our lives, but investing into yourself as a father for your family is one of the best ones you can make. Thanks again, Mike, for being here. I look forward to our next conversation and, and good luck with the book tour. Definitely. It was my pleasure. Thanks so much, John.